Corsage to camouflage was slightly a jumping off point, plus in fact um, um, a hungry publisher, which is wonderful. And uh, on top of that, a feeling which uh, has grown as I've done the research, that when you look at a war, I've always felt as a reporter going anywhere where there's conflict, that it's not just the military manoeuvres, it's not just the weaponry, the battles, the front lines. War affects everyone, particularly 20th century wars and onwards now into this one. Everyone, whether they like it or not. And so I always felt as a reporter you ought to try and find out how everybody is faring uh, as well as the significant stuff, you know, on the fighting side. And when you look at World War I, it's amazing. It's just amazing. The entire nation is involved. Some people are sometimes a little sniffy about the, the local history centres which have sprung up over the years. Um, and I know that even in my hometown there are a very large number of very happy pensioners all sitting there writing little vignettes about things that they remembered in their youth. And that's lovely. But a lot of them have, are a marvellous repository, uh, not only of local newspaper archives uh, and of newspapers long gone as well, but also of oddball books that have just trotted in over the years and sometimes people have brought them in and they are a treasure trove and particularly when you look at World War I with so many people who recorded their, um, their daily lives, there were diaries or wonderful letters to the local newspaper, uh, much better than the national press. It really gives you a feel how people were surviving during the war. It's, they're quite fabulous. I spent a lot of time in Sunderland and in Newcastle, both of whom are, which I know well. Uh, and, they, and Newcastle came up with this fantastic stuff, which not only had um, reports and articles, but pictures of ladies playing football. I wasn't writing a book about in time what happened, you know, from 1918 onwards till today. I just picked out a few things. But when you see the strides that women made in all kinds of things, employment, in their status, in the professions, uh, in medicine, uh, and how they've tried to actually get equality in the Church of England, all of these things, yes, there is an ongoing story. And I picked out one or two what I thought were highlights. And some of the quite staggering ones are the highlights about how women fared in the last 80 years. Wonderful stuff um, in newspaper reports in the 1950s about uh, boys' football teams. Well, we're not playing girls because we'd, we'd be sissies. Of women being refused decade after decade probably because they were teaching often in boys' schools or they had mixed schools. They, uh, the FA totally refused to let them play, to take uh, the referees' exams. They said, we don't want women doing that. It would mean, and this wasn't this long ago, I had a wonderful quote, it would mean men being told what to do by women. I, this is football, for heaven's sake. And you look at the women's team today. Well. Um, it's not without its little grouses about not being treated equally when you compare it to the men's team, and quite right too. So I found it quite fascinating to see how women dealt with it and how everybody else did back in 1917. Women were, uh, rather than you know, achieving um, or remarkable, they were splendid. Uh, splendid is a fascinating word when you begin to try and think what it stands for. Yes, it's sort of glamorous, it's sort of gilded, splendor, splendid, but it's a bit flash in the pan. You don't expect it to last. And that's exactly what they implied with the use of the word. You're splendid then, your moment of splendor, uh, showing what you could do during World War I, and then mm, went over again. The other word, which has fallen somewhat out of use, is plucky, uh, plucky women. Uh, this is usually used to avoid the words brave or courageous, very determinedly. You wouldn't call 
a grown man, plucky, would you? Well, probably it'd be dangerous if you did. Um, it may be as for children. Ergo, it was for women. And you see the use of this language, which isn't, you know, um, inherently sexist, but it's used in that way. And it just, you know, sort of colours all the descriptions of what women did. And the word splendid. I mean, I actually wondered about calling the book The Women Are Splendid, but then you'd have to have a large paragraph on the front explaining what I was <laughs> meaning. But it is very noticeable if, you know, so much of human attitudes come out of just little shades of the language. I think you can't really grasp social history unless you know where we've come from. Um, if you're looking at all sorts of aspects of social history, how people dress, how they speak, how they behave to each other, what is the norm in everyday life, our customs and practices, um, it is as of nothing to discuss it if you don't actually put it in the context of where it's come from, of what we used to do. I go around explaining to young students who forget what um, uh, it is to shake a hand at a graduation ceremony and you say, we do it to show we are not drawing a sword. And they look completely dumbfounded. You see, it has context. It was a gesture that I am non-aggressive. And they go, ah, you see, that is what social history is, is about. Knowing how it has evolved, uh, how it has changed, how we drop some things, take other things up, how some come back. And if you're looking at how women were treated in um, that period between 1418, um, first of all, you've got to actually say, how did war change it from pre-war times? But you've also got to say to readers today, particularly young readers, look, people, people thought rather differently. Um, there were men who stood up in public and said things like, women have smaller brains, it's scientifically proved. And people said, oh, there's a clever person, he knows that, therefore women can't think as much as men. Now, when you have that sort of thing said, and it permeates ordinary people's thinking, you realise you have very different attitudes. There were people who didn't want to employ women because they thought they'd get really sort of overstressed by having to think a lot. Oh, well, that all came from these misconceptions and conventional attitudes. And if you don't understand those, you don't understand, you know, what women actually did achieve against those odds. No, the woman who really strikes a modern chord, because I suppose you look at it that way, is Mabel Sinclair Stobart, entirely forgotten now, who led, an, she was a suffrage uh, campaigner, she's an extraordinarily sort of far-thinking woman, who years before the war was one of several individuals who thought, you know, with storm clouds gathering, there should be a role for women and she began thinking what it should be. And she, in fact, went off um, in a, to a Balkan war uh, two years before the First World War started, saying, you know, there's a role for women, you know, not soldiers, of getting injured people from the battlefield. There'd been people involved in the first aid nursing yeomanry who'd thought the same. Well, they were good thinkers, creative thinkers. What can we do? What should we do? The other thing is, she, she made wonderful speeches and it was full of remarks like, look, stop just thinking about it, do it. It's not just thoughts that will take us forward, it's actions. She's wonderful, you know, you'd like to have her around today. You mentioned Sarah Brown's book, uh, <coughs> The New Woman, which in the 1890s is published. Yes. Um, and then there's all these advancements that come through, uh, the women just do things and get on yes. with things and make these. Yeah. Why do we then, why do women then fall back? Is it just that men come rushing back and push them out? It's a complex thing. Yes. First of all, it's the state of the country. Um, it, it's absolutely desperate. Uh, there's been this appalling flu. There are so many people dying, and not from war, but from uh, this ghastly, ghastly Spanish flu, uh, which carried off two of the grandmothers in my family. Um, there were, people were exhausted. Not a time to keep up campaigns. 
people physically were knackered. There was no other word for it. You had so many men coming back and they wanted their jobs back and they'd been promised them. A lot of these women had been told just for the duration. That's all you had to say. They were literally kicked out. Then I think there was something else, and I do remember this, that my parents talked about this in 1945-46, before I was born, they said, do you know, after a long war, what you think you're fighting for is the country as you remember it in peacetime before the war. You want back what used to be. And I think there was innately in a lot of people a desire to say, no, 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 oh no, not more change. We've had terrible years of our worlds turned upside down. Can we go back to where it was? And there was quite, and that of course did affect attitudes to women. Let's go back to Edwardian times rather. But, I mean, by then, you know, the, uh, the little truth was out the box. The women could do it. And there were lots of women about who said, oh, it might be like this now. But we're going to tell everybody. We're going to tell our daughters and our granddaughters what we could do.